Karin Soroya of RE. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. What I would love to know a little bit more about is your background and then what led you into RE. And then we'll unpack what RE is in just a second. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been building technology businesses now for about 12 years. Uh, started my career as a managing consultant uh, at Oliver Wyman in their financial services practice, did a bunch of interesting work, but ultimately decided that um, my risk reward mechanism, internal risk reward mechanism was slightly tilted in the direction of risk. Uh, uh, and so I, I left uh, you know, managing consulting to build uh, initially an e-commerce marketplace called StyleKit where I sold high end fashion on the internet. Uh, that business grew to about a million active users ended up joining uh, Shopify as a result of that, myself and my co-founders. Wow. Uh, we worked on a number of interesting projects there in the mobile space, and then uh, decided that we still had the itch uh, and that we still wanted to build products for ourselves uh, and applied to Y Combinator um, in, you know, in and around 2016 uh, with a relatively nascent idea for a insurance app on your phone uh, that would make it as simple as taking a picture uh, to get insurance. And that was kind of the thesis. The thesis was we built really beautiful products. We could drive millions of people through our apps and we've proven the ability to do that. Um, we wanted something that, uh, you know, looked and felt like a recurring revenue business, uh, potentially uh, with, with solid underlying economics. And so we set out on a journey, not knowing very much about insurance, candidly, um, uh, built a lead, effectively a lead gener a generation application and, you know, you never really end up uh, where, you, where you anticipate you will. Uh, <laughs> and, and over the course of seven years, ended up building an underwriting business. So effectively issuing insurance policies of our own, uh, you know, to policyholders across the United States. Uh, and, and through that process, got to learn quite a bit more. Seven years in insurance is, especially when you're building an insurance uh, entity from scratch, a national insurance entity from scratch. You learn quite a bit about uh, who the players are, um, you know, which intermediaries uh, are driving value, which are not, which are supported by technology, which are not. Um, and we were lucky enough uh, to be surrounded by a lot of smart people, a lot of smart partners um, that uh, were open and willing to share in kind of an apprenticeship way uh, their understanding of the reinsurance market, which is effectively insurance for other insurance companies, if you want to think about it that way. Um, okay. So, so uh, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so, you, so as opposed to selling individual policies, we would be backing baskets of tens of thousands of policies for, for other insurance companies and specifically specialty insurance companies with a, uh, with a focus on a, on a particular niche. Um, in re, you know, we, we were thinking about what, uh, well, one on its own, the reinsurance business tends to be a self-compounding profitable thing to, to endeavor to, especially if you have you have capital. Um, and you know, we, we thought very critically for some time about what it was that we could do in this business um, that would be a step function change from what it is today. Um, and, and so what we, we arrived at was, hey, there are these emergent new technologies. I think folks are generally familiar with blockchains and the use of public ledgers to memorialize transactions in a way that can't be changed. History cannot be rewritten. Um, and and uh, so we, we looked at this and we decided to build on the Avalanche blockchain, a, a protocol that you can think about as incredibly transparent public accounting software that sits on top of one of the deepest you know, alternative asset classes in the world, which is a trillion dollar reinsurance market. And, and, and so we effectively decided to go out and build a decentralized Lloyds of London that takes all the data that comes in from insurance companies and the results that come in from insurance companies, memorializes it on, on a block of public blockchain, uh, makes available to regulators and investors uh, the ability to query what risks we're on and what capital backs those risks at a given point in time, and then uh, builds a way for accredited investors to go through KYC to put down money and start earning insurance premiums from tens of thousands of small businesses across America, or tens of thousands of artisan contractors, or you know, hundreds of thousands of, of homeowners, or hundreds of thousands of auto insurance policies at a given point in time. Um, 
And so you want to think about it, it's like really this, this public accounting software enables broader access and participation into uh, an asset class that is uncorrelated and very, very deep. That's that's what we've been up to. That's just a little, right? That's, that's <laughs> my goodness. Yeah, that's quite an endeavor to, uh, to unpack. So yeah. maybe going back a little bit um, to the reinsurance model. So would an AIG, a massive organization, have uh, reinsurance themselves? I'm assuming they would, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So, so I mean, sophisticated financial institutions uh, and even sophisticated corporates um, are, are, you know, in the, in the business of managing risk uh, often, right, at a particular scale. And then that can come in the form of, you know, direct insurance. They can come in the form of self-insurance by the creation of captives, look, which look a lot like reinsurance where you pay into them. Um, uh, and then various, you know, other structured finance or reinsurance arrangements that help them achieve the goals they want to achieve. So, you know, in, in the Bay Area, I can tell you with certainty there, practically every large technology company has captives that help them reinsure themselves against general liability exposures, potentially workers' compensation. It's like there's a broad array of risks inherent to running a business that in some instances you can self-insure for, then you work with other reinsurers kind of cap cap your liabilities. And so it's very possible for a protocol like ours to participate on, you know, an Uber ride sharing deal or, um, you know, help to uh, uh, to secure the property or the, the million dollar guarantee for an Air, Airbnb, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess host guarantee. There, there are a huge varieties, these things that we can start to take participation on. And the beauty of reinsurance is, you know, it is to our benefit to get bigger and more diversified uh, uh, over time uh, so that the returns and the economics are much more predictable as we kind of scale. Yeah. No, fantastic. That makes a lot of sense given, yeah, insurance that you want to make sure that you know, yeah. cast a wide net just in case something were to happen. Right. Um, and in that sense, who are your primary customers at this stage? Yeah, so so we work um, with with specialty insurance companies. Those those are our customers. Um, so we went from effectively selling policies on a direct to consumer basis, and eventually through agencies, uh, to developing relationships um, with teams uh, at insurance companies and teams that work with insurance companies that have deep domain expertise in a particular discipline. Um, uh, and so the idea here is that as opposed to betting on generalists, we want to work with folks that have a really deep understanding of exactly for aviation insurance, uh, uh, you know, for professional pilots or mature pilots. We want folks with really deep expertise in a particular transportation domain, a particular property domain. Um, you know, at some point or another, we'll think about earthquakes and, 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 and you know, uh, fires and floods, but we stay out of the, vol the high volatility stuff for now. The, the general idea here is, um, we we don't think that internally as a protocol, especially as somewhat subscale, we will be the ones with the deep domain expertise. We think that having this information live on a blockchain enables sophisticated actors around the world, the underwriters and actuaries that have lived and breathed a particular line of business to put up their hand to start to act in a distributed way to underwrite risk uh, and present it to a protocol that then will supply capital to them. Uh, to be able to take that on. So okay. it's, it's, it, the way that you should think about it is like a traditional insurance company or reinsurer has a mo is a monolith, right? There are lots of in individual teams um, at significant overhead costs. We're kind of extracting the value creators and giving them uh, the ability to set up shop on their own it, it is, is what, you know, DeFi enables. Yeah, no. So this is great. Um, it makes makes a lot of sense. I want to make sure that I understand it in a uh, crystal clear fashion. But you keep using the word protocol, which I think is fantastic. Would you associate that with also like a platform that essentially you're the, I'm not going to call you the intermediary, but you are the foundation where a lot of groups can plug in from both sides? Yeah. So, so um, you know, the, the Web3, um, uh, we're, we're building distributed software. You can think about this as like open source software that um, the contributors to and the participants of which have a say in how it, it, it's modified over time, right? And so there are actually real in insurance, there are already examples of things that look like this third party contributory databases. LexisNexis, Verisk have effectively established 
unions amongst insurance companies where they promote data sharing around claims, uh, specific models, um, you know, uh, other relevant features that will help them arrive at underwriting decisions or pricing decisions. So this is not actually foreign to, to insurance. It's the use of a modern technology to kind of drive to a similar set of results in, in collaboration amongst actors in the space. Um, so, so yes, it's open source software. We want market participants to have a say, clearly. Uh, we want them to contribute data. We want them to transact on this layer. And, you know, that's kind of where we're, we're headed. It's really interesting. So one of the things that you mentioned really begs the question from me to ask, and I hope this is okay, would you ever consider this as a DAO? It's a possibility. Um, you know, I my my viewpoint on DAOs um, has changed over time. And I think part of it is like, I've just built a bunch of centralized businesses and I know how hard it is to, to arrive at, um, you know, product market fit, uh, build a company and the discrete functions that are necessary for you to scale. Um, in general, I don't think that I believe that at the early stages, a business can be built by consensus. I think that over time, once you've got, you know, the machinery built, um, if you're now at a point where you're tweaking parameters around, a, a, you know, an investment policy or like, uh, uh, you know, changes to particular features, um, I, I think that those things, uh, especially because it's direct user feedback from folks who are effectively owners in, in, in this underlying software um, is relevant, but I think it is very, very hard to iterate as quickly as you need to, to get to an answer early on as a DAO. It's just tough. I couldn't agree with you more. It's one of those things that I've gone back and forth with a bunch over the years when I first started using or playing around with DAOs. And it seems that in the beginning, you need to have some group of consensus around things with a set group or party that was working on it. And then eventually as time goes on and you feel like you have this uh, this boat that's essentially built and then you push it out into the water and then there's certain people or groups on it that can then help guide it in certain directions. Yeah. That seems to make the most sense. Yeah. Um, but we'll I, I think it, it's like, um, it's like building, yeah, right. Let's say building the boat, right. We're effectively building a utility that lives in a distributed way. Um, and that utility now has broad, broad participation and interest from, from the down members, but it is, um, it's got to get there first. Right? Like it's a, that, that's a tough hurdle. Yeah. So on the, um, and this is just me speaking off the top of my head and in a way I'm trying to figure out like, are you all responsible for any of the auditing or any components therein around the, the groups that you take on? Yeah. So, so we're, I mean, we're still a regulated entity, right? So this, so this is thematically, what's super interesting is like it kind of tackled a couple things at the same time, right? Like we've got, tokenization of real world assets. These are ins underlying insurance insurance contracts. We're also building into a highly regulated space, right? Regulators and in insurance really care that the underlying insurer or reinsurer is able to make it, meet their financial obligations to policyholders first and foremost, right? And, and they, there's a, a number of frameworks and constructs around um, that make sure that that's the case. So we have to conform to those things. There, there's no question um, that you know we outside of emitting or or publishing our capital position what risks we're party to on a, on a public ledger um or it, it is that in and of itself is a tool that kind of enhances the ability for us um at, and should be congruent with audits that are run by you know a big four accounting firm um or or, or otherwise um so so what i think regulators like about what we're doing is we're actually just committing to what they would otherwise want, but on a real-time basis. Um, it, they, they've never seen anything like that before, right? Like you don't see insurance companies or reinsurers going full open kimono with <laughs> all, all of the, the trends, every single transaction that they're party to being part, uh, you know, part and parcel to a public ledger. Um, so, so in many ways, I think what we're doing enhances um, the abilities uh, of the regulator. And I, and I think that's why we've been generally well-received. Uh, is, is, as a regulated entity that's operating in DeFi. Does the general uncertainty that some people feel like uh, in the U.S. around regulation give you any pause about uh, the current environment here, especially around DeFi? Yeah, so, you know, what? what's heartening is that people are still fighting, right? Um, 
what's disheartening is the people that have, you know, Coinbase and, and the like, like folks who have spent incredible sums of money um, trying to be compliant, stay above board, proactive about reporting, uh, pro, uh, kind of, and this is my personal view, I don't know if it reflects a company or, or anyone else, but it is disheartening for folks to put in the time, energy, and effort. These are like very productive human beings, right? That, that could, could otherwise be allocated to doing really productive things, just being stonewalled, right, effectively. Uh, and, and so so it is, it's difficult, and I worry um, that others will take up the mantle of innovation in this realm, especially as we, you know, the, the two secular trends that I see happening in the, in the, in the crypto and blockchain space are clearly one, tokenization of real world assets, and then two, uh, going hand in hand with generative AI, the, the, the me mechanisms that are being, will be built and are being built to prove providence of content and other human created things, right? Like those things are going to happen. These things will happen hand in hand. Um, and if it doesn't happen in the United States, that's a problem, right? Um, yeah. and, and so uh, I, I worry a little bit. Um, I from from the recontext, I worry less because we we are already regulated, and insurance in the United States is not regulated at the federal level; it's regulated at the state level. Um, and there's, there's a McCarran-Ferguson Act that that it's actually prohibits federal oversight of insurance businesses in general. Um, huh. So it's a unique little a unique little exception. Um, uh, but you know, I, if I'm thinking about the health of the ecosystem, especially things that are being built in in the U.S., I'm a little bit concerned now. Yeah, I and I would second that. I mean, even I think Brian Armstrong of Coinbase uh, today or yesterday said that it's not uh, out of the question that they may move outside of the U.S. And that's that's a statement in and of itself. And I know Gary Gensler was testifying here in D.C. today about some of these things. So I guess we'll have to see what happens. But the hope is that we find some sort of middle range where there's definitely some regulation, some guidance sure. about what needs to be done, and then people can feel a little more free yeah. to, to innovate here and not have to go anywhere else. Um, yeah, and I think I think the guardrails are coming, right? Like, There's no question. I, I, I think the guardrails should have came before the enforcement actions, but, yes. uh, <laughs> but uh, they're coming anyhow. No doubt. Okay, so maybe one of the last questions that I have, and then if there's anything else that you'd like to mention, please do so. But what does the future look like in your world with RE and beyond um, in this space? Yeah, so, you know, we took significant inspiration from Lloyd's of London, right? Like Lloyd's of London is a 350-year-old reinsurance marketplace um, that, you know, has been transacting for quite some time, has been through uh, all sorts of upheaval, um, and, ha and has lived as a, as a compounding marketplace and partly, partly because of its distributed nature, right? They they actually also have these this concept of syndicates, these individual teams of underwriters and actuaries with, with a specific focus, and they're set up like a market. Um, so we took we took significant information from them in the in the architecture of what we're building. But you can also just easily draw a line between what did Lloyd's do after, right? Like they set they set up, um, you know, admitted insurance companies in practically every every country in the world. Uh, to be able to feed, uh, you know, this this reinsurance market, um, and and are building software solutions to make the lives of other insurance companies around the world easier, kind of forcing them, but well, to a lesser extent forcing them, but at least enabling uh, enabling them with with things that they otherwise would not be able to do. In, in our case, right, uh, what we arc towards now is like, hey, yes, like if if you've got smart people around the world pontificating on aviation and nuclear pools and transportation and commercial, like all this stuff, there should be a single home on the internet for them to live, right? Um, and you can consolidate reinsurance into a single transaction layer where cost of capital comes all the way down because the bigger you get, the, that's just the way, and you, you get diversification effects, you get new, new investors, you get new pools of capital kind of pull in. I think that the internet is going to force this, and especially distributed technology is going to force this to be really, really big. And then you're going to see all sorts of stuff that's uh, software built around the, the periphery of this that helps insurance companies do their jobs better. I think that's what's going to happen. No, it's fascinating. Um, I didn't know all about that. And that's, it's great to hear about it. Uh, my goodness. Well, Karn, I really appreciate your time here. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Always happy to talk insurance. <laughs> All right. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.